Last month saw the release of the book Unsettled by Steve Coonin. This video is not a review of the book, but instead it is a discussion of the high temperature public spat over the book's launch, drawing in a bunch of climate scientists and Coonin himself into a rather extraordinary exchange. That exchange both challenges Coonin's framing of the issues while also demonstrating some of the bad behaviour by the scientists that is arguably Coonin's most legitimate target. It's messy, it's scrappy, it's rather important. Let's take a look. Steve Coonin is an American theoretical physicist. As he's now widely known, he served in the Obama administration's Department of Energy as Undersecretary for Science. And that's relevant because it's what gets the attention. The media loves nothing more than a true believer who repented and is now coming out as a truth teller. It's doubtful that actually describes Coonin's role though. He was tapped for the position by Obama's first Secretary of Energy, Stephen Chu, himself a physicist, indeed a Nobel Prize winning one. Chu said that he specifically asked Coonin to join him because of his willingness to challenge conventional wisdom. Now that makes Chu sound to me like an effective leader. Because the last thing you want as a leader, if you want to be a good one anyway, is to surround yourself with yes men. And he said this, if there's a bandwagon moving along, you need a bunch of people to say, wait a minute, how do you know this? How do you know that? I think Coonin is of that ilk. He loves to be the curmudgeon type. Chu has a different opinion to Coonin on the issues around climate change, but he nevertheless maintains that sceptics like him play an important role in the scientific community. This is a lot of what keeps science honest, he said. So really Coonin is a habitual sceptic, not a reformed believer. And I agree with Chu personally, such people are essential. None of that makes any difference to the substance of what he's saying. That should be judged on its own merits. But it's also just worth noting not to get too far taken in with the marketing. So, what's the essence of the book? Well, essentially it's a two-part proposition. One, the popular view of what the science of climate change actually says is overblown and wrong. And two, many of the proposed solutions would not work. And there are other things that we should think about doing. Well, in broad outline, those are propositions you could easily hear from time to time on this channel within certain contexts. So we go to it with an open mind on how this plays out. Although there's something in the language that from the start doesn't seem consistent. Here's how the book's promotion summarises it. When it comes to climate change, the media, politicians and other prominent voices have declared that the science is settled. In reality, the long game of telephone from research to reports to the popular media is corrupted by misunderstanding and misinformation. Core questions about the way the climate is responding to our influence and what the impacts will be remain largely unanswered. The climate is changing, but the why and how are not as clear as you've probably been led to believe. That intro actually covers two propositions. One, as I already mentioned, that the public debate on climate change doesn't reflect the actual science. The long game of telephone, as he describes it. But then he turns back on that science, saying that the core questions remain largely unanswered. And that is actually substantially a different proposition. And it's arguably the one that is given the most weight by the title of the book, Unsettled. This refers to the phrase, the science is settled. Some people have used to try and shut the door on ongoing first principle debates and some others have used to try and shut the door on any debate whatsoever. So whereas you could have, in theory at least, recruited a good part of the scientific community behind the first proposition, you're going to have to work extra hard to do so on the second. That may be why some of the response to the book and the promotional articles written about it has been strong, high profile not always particularly scientific. Let's look at the tenor of the response first before we go and pull out challenges on specific issues of fact. 
Most remarkable was the fact that Scientific American carried an attacking article, its second on the book actually, penned by 12 authors, including some of the campaigning scientists such as Michael Mann and Naomi Oreskes. It's headed, That Obama Scientist Climate Skeptic You've Been Hearing About. His track record on getting climate science right is extremely poor. So the title and the subtitle both focused on the person, not any aspect of the message. And that kind of sets the tone. Here's the first paragraph. If you'd heard only that a scientist who had served in the Trump administration and now regularly appears on Fox News and other conservative media thinks climate change is a hoax, you'd roll your eyes and move on. But if you heard that someone associated with former President Barack Obama's Democratic administration was calling the climate science consensus a conspiracy, the novelty of a messenger might make you take it a little more seriously. Let's just remember briefly that one of the arguments made by scientists as to why they didn't take the Wuhan lab leak hypothesis seriously, the hypothesis that's now being taken seriously all over the place, was because it had been mentioned by Trump. The practice of dismissing arguments because of who they're associated with should not be a thing that scientists do. Yes, there are numerous commentators on climate who have little to offer but delusions based on wishful thinking, but you find that out by listening to the arguments and responding. Anyway, they go on to say this. Koonin wants you to think that climate change isn't a big deal. But unfortunately, climate change is real, is caused primarily by burning fossil fuels and is already hurting people all over the world, including here in the United States. They criticise him for having organised a debate in 2014 where in front of the members of the American Physical Society, a panel of three climate scientists argued with three leading sceptics on the detail of the science. Now, I'm not sure why even the principle of having such a debate in front of a scientific, well-informed audience is a problem, but apparently it is. The article repeats some of the points of detail, which we will deal with in a moment, but finishes with this paragraph. Koonin isn't lying about having worked for the Obama administration, but he's certainly trying to portray himself as something better than he is. A crank who's only taken seriously by far-right disinformation peddlers, hungry for anything they can use to score political points. He's just another denier trying to sell a book. Calling people names and associating them by innuendo with the far right, that is not an honourable way to conduct any kind of issue-based discussion. I'm sorry, but as far as I'm concerned, any scientists who associate themselves with that sort of smear is doing so at a cost of their credibility and reputation in science. Indeed, they're even illustrating that at least part of the problem Koonin is seeking to identify has some potential substance. Which isn't to say that there's no reasonable complaint against Koonin's approach if you stick to the facts of what he's saying and the way that it's being said. So let's focus in on some of the points of substance that has been highlighted in his promotion of the book and which are largely the key points given in the book's introduction. Let's take this promotional interview he did with CNBC. He was asked a rambling question, the thrust of which was, what are the key points? And he replied like this, well, humans are certainly influencing the climate, and human influences are growing as carbon dioxide in the atmosphere grows. But beyond a warming of about 2 degrees Fahrenheit over the last century, we don't see many impacts on severe weather events. For example, heat waves in the US are no more common today than they were in 1900, and they haven't gone up in 60 years. We have no detectable human influences on hurricanes and global wildfires have declined by 25% since 2003, despite the terrible fires we saw in California and Australia in 2020. 2020 was one of the least active global fire years on record. And so the notion that we've broken the climate is somehow misplaced. So he gives some concrete stats, but it's notable that his argument is very specifically framed, that the definition of problems with climate change must be about extreme weather events experienced up to today. Well, the IPCC reports would generally say that we're seeing trends of rising temperatures today, the consequences of extreme events will follow. 
and they aim to show how this will play out with climate models. Arguing that we haven't yet seen extreme events isn't therefore a counter to the science. Now, it could be a counter to the journalists, the extreme campaigners, the pundits, and some of the outlier scientists, perhaps, who point at the very extreme, every extreme event as evidence of climate change. And Coonin would argue that's what he's doing, but he's attaching it to an argument that we don't need to take policy action to any serious degree. Well, the scientists who produce the IPCC reports say that the evidence supports the conclusion that we do. So which is it? Is it a challenge to misrepresentations of the science and the bad policy that could follow from that? Or is it a challenge to the mainstream science itself? and the idea that much needs to be done at all. When Kunin replied to some of the criticisms, he rather implies it's the former, pointing out how the detail of his book goes into all the nuances described by his critics in line with the IPCC. But when he promotes and summarises his book, he seems to heavily imply the latter, which is exactly why I guess some people have responded very strongly. Well, look, let's quickly cover some of the specifics that he highlights. So his first statement, heat waves in the US, no more common today than they were in 1900, and they haven't gone up in 60 years. This is one of those very carefully crafted statements. In context, it seems to imply that nothing suggesting extreme events has happened to date, and therefore probably won't again in the future. First, he duplicates the trick used by some of the bad faith propagandists in this area, talking about US climate rather than global climate. The poles are warming faster than the mid-latitudes, for instance. Africa, which is more vulnerable to increases in heat waves, has indeed seen an increase in their occurrence, according to this paper by Rousseau et al., published in 2016. A response to the claim in a separate review of a book, also in Scientific American, said this... Whether or not they are becoming more frequent, they have clearly become hotter and longer over the past few decades, while populations have grown more vulnerable in large measure because they are on average older. Moreover, during these longer extreme heat events, it is nighttime temperatures that are increasing most. As a result, people never get relief from insufferable heat, and more of them are at risk of dying. The second statement, we have no detectable human influences on hurricanes. The Climate Feedback website offered a fact check on Kunin's key claims and it responded to that one with a reply by Kerry Emanuel, a professor of atmospheric science at MIT. This statement is flat out wrong. In the first place, the theoretically predicted trends would not have been detectable in the sparse and noisy hurricane record until recently. And in fact, they have recently been detected. The most up-to-date research published in the Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences demonstrates an increase in the proportion of hurricanes that become major hurricanes, category 3 to 5, globally, supporting theoretical predictions that date back to 1987. And it highlights this graph from Cossin et al. 2020. Kunin has actually responded to that criticism and argued that he covered Cossin et al. in the detail of his book. He points out that the paper's bottom line conclusion actually supports his position and he quoted the paper directly. Ultimately, there are many factors that contribute to the characteristics and observed changes in TC, which is tropical cyclone, intensity. And this work makes no attempt to formally disentangle all of these factors. In particular, the significant trends identified in this empirical study do not constitute a traditional formal detection and cannot precisely quantify the contribution from anthropogenic factors. And yes, I checked, and that is an accurate quote, not apparently plucked out of context. And Kooning finishes his reply by saying this. The fact is that while it is not unreasonable to think that warming might indeed lead to some kind of change in hurricane activity at some point, right now there simply isn't evidence that this is happening. That is one of the criticisms where he had the best comeback in terms of disputing the truth of what was being put to him. Arguably, he does so in terms that you would characterise as reasoned debate, I would have said, rather than, you know, the ravings of a crank. Most of his other points, his response goes along the lines of, yes, they don't dispute the accuracy of my point, but they explain a bunch of additional context which I agree with, and I include in chapter X of my book. 
Which brings you right back to the question, what are we really arguing about here? Why is the evidence of what's happened to date being disputed in furious terms when it's not really at the heart of the argument as to whether we need to take action? Well, the dozen scientists who decided to label Kunin as a crank were happy to embrace the framing, apparently. They talked about climate change is real, is caused primarily by burning fossil fuels and is already hurting people all over the world, including here in the United States. For example, a study published recently found that because climate change has caused sea levels to rise, Superstorm Sandy flooded an additional 36,000 homes, impacting 71,000 people who would have been safe otherwise, and caused $8 billion in additional damage. That study, by the way, is this one, which, to be fair to Kunin, was published in May 2021, about the same time as his book. The 12 go on to say this. How many people are suffering and paying in healthcare costs because of fossil fuels isn't the kind of thing Steve Kunin thinks you should worry about, though. Well, that isn't exactly a balanced reflection of the discussion. I mean, look, you could easily turn that around and say, how many people are living out of poverty, living longer and more healthy lives because of fossil fuels isn't the kind of thing Naomi Oreskes and Michael Mann thinks you should worry about. But look, the real question is whether they weren't suckered into accepting Kooning's framing in the first place. Here's my summary. I think Steve Kooning had a significant opportunity to make a big impact in an area of real importance, but for whatever reason, he fluffed it. The good points he had, that there's ample room for people of good faith to challenge the public perceptions, the deeply politicised exaggerations on the topic of climate change, which are influencing public policy and especially to challenge the arguably hastily worked out, massively expensive policy proposals being put forward to address it. His argument that we do need to act on climate change, but it would be better to do so in a well thought through, skillfully managed way, that is a debate that should be happening on all sides of the political aisle right now. Don't get me wrong, there are good arguments to counter the case. It's a debate that can be well joined on both sides. But the point is you have to have the debate to test the strength of your ideas on both sides. Unfortunately, Kunin's ability to make that argument is undermined by his puzzling decision to position himself with the side that also says there's not much going on with climate change. It's not really a serious issue. And that's bewildering because he accepts the IPCC reports, at least the data and the research part of them, He's happy to agree that the planet is warming, the evidence confirms that it's influenced by human-caused emissions, but then he cherry-picks certain details, true details mostly, and presents them in a way that suggests that the science says that there isn't anything of interest that's happening, rather than what would be a powerful critique as the ex-Obama man pointing to the genuine points where the Democrats and journalists misrepresent the science, blow it out of all proportion, 12 years to save the planet, blah, 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 blah. That is an open goal he is well positioned to score in. His answer to the scientist's critique is to say, but if you look at exactly what I say in my book, I acknowledge all that. But if you don't reflect the nuance in your promotional appearances that you've had as a result of the book, well, it's not clear what you're actually trying to achieve with it. It's a shame, because you don't have to cherry-pick to make the case that he's making, and it would have been a lot more powerful if he'd fairly represented the science and then drawn a sharp contrast between that and the public debate. You could go after Joe Biden and CNN and Obama, heck, even St. Greta herself on that basis. And there's a powerful argument to be made that the activist elements of the climate science community are tolerating those exaggerations and misrepresentations from one side of a political aisle because they think the end justifies the means. And that damages the work of the non-activist scientists and our public policy space overall. However well he does or he doesn't make that case in his book, he has failed to do it in the public discussion based on the book. He comes across as simply arguing for inaction, although in the detail, that's not what he's actually arguing for. If a popular perception of what you're saying doesn't match the detail of what you think you're saying, then that is a communication failure on your part. Does any of this justify 
for name calling, the ad hominem attacks from the 12 scientists in Scientific American as well as elsewhere? Absolutely not. I would say the nature of the response exactly maps out the attitude that most needs to be challenged. It was a reminder that while the vast majority of scientists do good work, are not political and will look honestly for evidence that challenges the orthodoxy, as a community, it's not immune from groupthink. Kunin's promotion of his book has been a muddled slew of mixed messages. But the response to it has been gratuitously political and dismissive. I mean, in different ways, both sides let themselves down with poor communications, it's true. But the gulf between the scientific method and the letter in the Scientific American is arguably a far wider one. Kunin at least made arguments that could be engaged and refuted, which of course they were, and that's the process in action. But they met him with name-calling and the suggestion that he should be summarily dismissed as beneath contempt. That is not a good sign for the health of the debate. 